Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for being here today on a beautiful day in Seward. 365 days a year, the weather is like this year. It's just many days, so you have to go have to go 10 miles up to see the sun. But it is a beautiful day today. The bay is calm like glass, and uh, the sun is out, and we are in the right place. Exodus chapter 7, if you'll head there, Exodus chapter 7, good morning, Matt. We've been looking at um, the nation of Israel in bondage for generations. We're not just talking a bad hair day for a month, a year, a couple of years. We're talking generations, up to 10 generations, over 400, I think the scriptures say 430 years, they've been in bondage. All they know is what it's like to be under a taskmaster, taskmaster under the rule of a new pharaoh who has no clue who Jehovah God is. And uh, what's interesting is we find very similar parallels to the culture we live in today. Those that don't recognize a living God, those who are hateful, those that would just like to silence and Welch, uh, you and I, and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and even in the midst of all that, even in the midst as we step into the life of Moses again today, a man who murdered an Egyptian, heads out to the backside of the desert, and hangs out there for 40 years until God shows up and says, okay, I've got your attention now, I've heard the cry of my people, I've seen their, the oppression of my people. I'm going to deliver my people. And I don't know about you, Moses is probably like, yeah, woohoo, that's pretty awesome, God. And then God says, and I've chosen you, and I'm going to send you. And then, of course, all the excuses come with Moses, just like with us. Well, pff, how could I do that, you know? How can God change this situation? And today we're going to step into the life of Moses again in chapter 7 of Exodus, and we're going to take a look at what it is that God is really doing then, and is he still doing it today? Is God still at work today like he was in the life of Moses, in the life of the Egyptian people? So we're going to look at that scripture, Exodus 7, and uh, then we'll launch off. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and just uh, ask the Lord's blessing. Father, thank you for being a good father. You are faithful and true. You're holy and righteous. You're unchanging, eternal. Lord, you're compassionate and long-suffering. And Father, I pray that as your truth goes out, you'd lose your truth, bind the enemy. We need to be reminded of who we are in Christ and the promises that you've given us. There will be pharaohs that will come into our life. They may not be a person. Most of the time, they are relationships. They may be places, things, things that to us look impossible, but to you, you're always at work. So, Father, help us to respond in a way that you'd want us to by faith to your truth today. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. May he be Lord of our hearts and lives. Thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's look at Exodus chapter 7. I'm just going to read these few verses here, starting in verse 1. It says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. That's an interesting statement. We'll circle back around to that. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Verse 5 says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt, bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. Moses was fourscore, he was 80 years old, and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh, the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. 
And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. As we take a look at this <clears throat> life of Moses, as he goes back for a second time before a Pharaoh king. Now this Pharaoh is not the Pharaoh that uh, Joseph, when he was in the land of Egypt, um, he did not know the Lord. In fact, the scriptures will tell us that, and we'll see that here in a, in a moment. But he's a younger pharaoh, a younger king. History tells us that he's probably about 22 years old. Now think about this. Here's an 80-year-old man who comes in to a 22-year-old man who from man's perspective is one of the most, well, probably the most powerful man on the planet, and Moses stands there and is going to proclaim something to this man. Now, <clears throat> Moses, we can take, and we've done this in past lessons, Moses did not feel worthy to do what God had called him to do. And the whole point was, Moses, it's not about you. I am the Lord thy God. I am Jehovah God. It's not about what you think about yourself. Well, I'm not eloquent. I'm not, you know, I, I kind of, you know, people would say he, maybe he st st stuttered. He had a hard time. Well, we know from the book of Acts, he was wise among the Egyptians and in his deeds and in his speech. But there was something about when God called him to go into Egypt and declare unto Pharaoh a command under the authority of God that Moses time and time again would go, I'm not worthy, I'm not capable, I can't. And God would gently remind him, it's not about you, it's about me. Pharaoh and the Egyptians are going to see my power and my judgments and my wonders not because of you, but because of who I am. Don't forget that, Moses. And for you and I, by application, God would say this. Listen, the land that you and I live in, the culture that we live in, the neighborhood you live in, the place, maybe the family that you are around, and you think to yourself, how could God change this situation? God is a God who can do the impossible. And so <clears throat> it's encouraging to see that God had a plan of deliverance for the Israelites, and he had a message for Pharaoh, and he chose a man who in his own mind and heart, his heart of heart, said, how could this even happen to me? It's not even possible. But he was willing, and even in his failures, here's the point. You and I, we tend to focus on our failures, don't we? I'm a lousy parent. I said that again? I did that? You know? Or, man, that was a big letdown in the workplace. That was a great testimony of a follower of Jesus Christ. And the whole point is, if we focus on our infirmities, we'll forget the fact that that's exactly what God wants us to see, that we will mess up, that we are not capable. And in all of those failures, in our weaknesses, in the points where we, when we really in our heart of hearts go, God can't change this, God can't fix this. And sometimes God doesn't answer the way that we would desire hope. God would say, listen, in your weakness, that's when you'll begin to find strength, if you'll look to me. And so, let's look at a few thoughts today. If you look at Exodus chapter 7, go back to verses 1 and 2, and we'll see there'll be a few points up on the screen here. And that is a command. Look at Exodus 7, 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. That's a very interesting thought. Many times you and I will think, how can God fix this situation? Maybe God leads you, he prompts you, the Spirit of God prompts you. I want you to speak a word into the life of someone that I'm going to cross your path. <clears throat> Most of the time, if we're not careful, people will cross our path all the time and we're not sensitive to what God wants to do because he's called you and I in the lives of other people. And we'll miss opportunities. But in this situation... In Moses' mind of how could, what good could come out of what I'm about to say, God reminds Moses that Pharaoh thinks you're a god. It's an interesting statement. Look at the rest of this. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of the land. You see, 
God's spokesman, Moses, and his brother Aaron, here's that amazing statement. What? Pharaoh looks at me as a god? Moses, like you and I many times, stand or think in our heart of hearts that things are unchangeable and we're without power. And honestly, most things in life, if we're honest, the older we get, we find are really out of our control. Our health, our finances, our relationships. We can be an influence and we can speak truth and, and share truth and love and the hope and faith that we have in Jesus Christ. But really when it comes down to the people that we love the most, the, those that, oh, thank you, those that uh, we desire to see a change in, it's God that has to do the work in them. And so we see Moses, even though he may have felt alone and powerless, would declare the word of God. Pharaoh was going to view Moses as a God. Now, what does that mean for you and I? God chooses to use you and I in the lives of other people. Many times we'll focus on us. Well, I'm not capable. I've never done that. I've never been there before. Well, I'm not like Pastor Sinoreski or, you know, you fill in the blank. <clears throat> and many times we'll focus on ourselves and forget that God will give us the words to speak, just as he said to Moses, I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the words to say to give to Aaron and the words for him to say. I'll, I'll teach you what to do. Moses, I'll show you what to do. And we forget about that God is a God who is in control of all things and at work. He's at work in the hearts of lives of maybe those closest to you through relationships in your workplace, maybe in your family. And you think, how is it that their hearts are cold? They're becoming stubborn to the word of God. And God is at work. And the question is, no matter what kind of response will we go and be obedient to what God has commanded us to do? And so God was at work. He was at work in the heart of Pharaoh. Now think about this. An 80-year-old man comes in to a young 20-year-old man. Do you not think that Pharaoh, even though he may look around at all the gold and all the wealth that surrounded him and the servants that were in his court, if you would, and the soldiers that he knew that he had, the horses and the chariots and the armor, but do you know that when you and I if we'll, by God's grace, walk in the authority of Jesus Christ, God will work in the hearts of others. And I imagine if, if we'll find out one day, we'll let, Pharaoh, or, uh, we'll let Moses tell us this story, as he stood before Pharaoh and proclaimed this command, that I'm sure that all the insecurities that Pharaoh ever had began to just kind of bubble up to the surface. Is this, is this real? Because God was at work in his heart. You and I, when we go, we oftentimes think, well, the weather's not good enough today. You know, the response won't be good because we've been in this neighborhood before. God can't, but God is always at work. And if we forget that God is at work, we'll forget that God wants to use you and I in the lives of other people. Hold your place there. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for a minute. Because God wanted Moses to remember it wasn't about him. It wasn't or anything that he had to bring, but about the very message, the truth that God had for Moses to deliver. In the New Testament, we find this also very similar passage in uh, Paul, as he wrote to these believers in Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 4. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, just like Moses, well, I'm not eloquent, my speech, you know, it's, it's how is that going to convince? But look what Paul said, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And that's what Moses would do. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech, my preaching were not, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You see, Paul understood that the power that he spoke truth in the life of people wasn't found in his ability to communicate. Now, Paul was a well-educated man. He was, he was very smart. 
and the ways of the Jewish culture. But yet he would pray for boldness as he would carry the gospel message to the Gentiles. But he would rely upon the very spirit of God that indwelled him and the power of God to communicate the word of God by, by God's spirit. Paul understood that. And so it was with Moses. He stuttered. He was afraid. But God had put the fear of the Lord in the heart of Pharaoh. Never forget that, that God is at work. You and I oftentimes, <clears throat> you know, if you think about a thousand days is like a single day unto the Lord. That means God is at work for generations, setting up moments in time that could forever change the course of a human being, of where they'll spend their eternity. And God has chosen you. You think about these young babies that are going to come today, this, this exciting day, as they are dedicated and really will recognize their heritage. But the dedication comes to the commitment of those parents that will raise up those children, the next generation, those kids that are downstairs right now, the next generation, those that will hopefully be raised up. And it's amazing the young children that we have in this church. I look at their lives and look at how smart they are, how much they know Bible at this point, light years beyond most of us as adults probably at that age. And God wants to use them, and he wants to use you and I in the, in the lives of other people. Well, eventually, Moses would see God do what he promised he would do, but he would have to wait. Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Well, that's true, but it's not about you. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. But Moses was willing to go as his spokesman. The other part that I want to see, see in this first point, if you go back to Exodus chapter 7, verse 2, is that God had a message. I love that about our God. God still has a message, the very same message that the early church had about Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and his resurrection. God gives us the message clearly. We don't have to add to it. We don't have to take away from it. We don't have to rewrite it. God has clearly given us a message just as he gave Moses a message to take and to deliver to Pharaoh. Now, <clears throat> look what, at verse 2. That's part of it. It says, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. You see, God wanted Moses to know that he had taken somebody that thinks he's a nobody to take a very specific message to someone, the king of the known world, to speak truth to him. The words that Moses and Aaron were going to speak to Pharaoh were directly from God. Now that's important because for you and I, we oftentimes will focus just like Moses. Well, I'm not an eloquent of speech, you know, I, I don't know what quite to say. And yet the word of God teaches us that the spirit of God that indwells us will remind us of what Jesus has taught us through his word, will guide us into all truth. And the Spirit of God will be at work in the lives of the lost, showing righteousness and judgment, bring conviction, and help them to see truth. Look, if you would, hold your place there. Head over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 for a minute. 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 25. God has called us to take his specific message, the gospel, to wherever we go. Look at 1 Peter 1.25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The message of the gospel, according to the scriptures, the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that message has not changed. We don't have to reinvent. We don't have to add to. We don't have to subtract. We simply take the message of the gospel and share it. We're all, we all start out in the same boat. Isn't it funny how the Lord saves us? We come to know Jesus Christ at a point in our life. We believe on him. And he begins to change us from the inside out. And if we're not careful, we just think, you know, well, I've arrived. You know, if these guys saw the truth the, you know, that I'm sharing with you know, 
and just believed on Jesus. But you think about where you and I started, where we were, where God stepped into our life, how he's changed your life over, not just in a day. Well, there may have been some things that God delivered you from just you know, instantly, some aspects of your life. But honestly, over, it's over time. It's a relationship that over time, God begins changing you and I from the inside out. The same message, and that message is an important one that you and I take. It's so easy for us to assume where people are at in life. It's just like this. One day, once upon a time, now that, for those of you that are new here, that's the tagline that means what I'm about to tell you. There's truth in it, but because Ken can never remember stories, I just make them up. So that's why I never tell jokes, because I, I get to the punchline, I have to look to my wife like, how do, how do, what's, what's the punchline? I'll forget it, you know? So there's always truth in these. <clears throat> uh, it was a cold winter day. It had just snowed, and it's that kind of snow that we get oftentimes that it's about that deep and it's wet. And so as you're driving your car, you're wondering, am I even going to make it to work? But it was a cold, and then the temperature dropped, and it was a freezing day. Got to work, and then suddenly, bink, a text appears on the phone of this man that says, Windows frozen, won't open. And, of course, he was in a hurry getting ready for work, and he thought, well, pff, I'll just, you know, just warm up some, heat up some warm water, pour it on the edge of the window, and you can just, you know, open the windows. About 10 minutes go by, and bing, the text appears again, and it says, computer really messed up now. <laughs> windows. That's the operating system of the computer. You see, there was an assumption made on the part of the one that texted the man. They weren't even on the same page. The message was <laughs> completely misunderstood. And God's plan of deliverance begins with this command to give to his spokesman, Moses, followed by a very specific message. And God's message to Moses would also include a caution. That's going to be the next part that we're going to see here. Go back to Exodus chapter 7 for a minute. You think about this, hundreds of years of bondage. It may have appeared to the Israelites that it is impossible for God to deliver us. Moses, we've heard you that God's going to deliver us. But that time, the time you went before, before Pharaoh didn't turn out so well. Now we've got to come up with the straw, and these taskmasters are beating these Hebrew officers that are overseeing us, it's not going well. They may have thought, maybe God's forgotten about us. He can't deliver us. But their situation was continued to be in, in control, and he gave Moses a word of caution concerning his reception. Look at the, the very next verse here that we find. And that is, <clears throat> the Bible tells us in verse 3, and I will, what's the next word? Harden. Harden. Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. I'm sure Moses had <clears throat> maybe a, a moment of like surprise, even though this wasn't the first time God said, listen, you're going to declare a command to Pharaoh, but he's not going to respond. In fact, he's gonna, his heart will be hardened. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, the Bible tells us, but God wanted Moses to learn to rely on God's control. That's the hardest lesson for me, for you and I. We look at life and we think, how can God maybe deliver me, change the situation I'm in, fix the situation, work in the heart and life, change the, you know, whatever. And it could be any emotionally, physically, health. It could be spiritually. And we look and we go, how could God even make a difference? But God wanted Moses that when he came to those moments to realize, I am, I am a living God who's in control of all things. And I can change things. It doesn't mean that things will change maybe the way that we would like. I mean, if you just look at the physical, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, his infirmities, you know the story, would ask Jesus, would you deliver me? Would you take this infirmity, this physical infirmity? Out? No, sorry. 
Mm -mm. So I'll just ask again. I don't know about you, but sometimes my prayers are the same ones over and over. God, would you? No, sorry, Paul. A third time, no. You know, I'm not. This infirmity in your life, you're going to have to rely upon my grace. In fact, when you find it showing its ugly head and limiting what you can physically do, that if you'll trust me and rely on my grace, that's when you'll begin to find the strength you need. As far as we know from the scriptures, it, there's nowhere in there where you find that Paul, well, yes, I take that back. He was delivered. When he stepped into eternity, he was delivered from that physical infirmity. But from that point when Satan buffeted him until he breathed his last breath, he would have to rely upon the grace of God, just like you and I do. Look at Luke chapter 9 for a minute. Go to Luke chapter 9 and look at this verse in verse 23. We need to rely on God and trust Him for His results. <clears throat> Luke 9, 23, the Bible says this, And He said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus just simply asks you and I to follow Him, to yoke up with Him. His burden is light. And the difficulties that will come our way as we walk through this life, they will squeeze us. They will test our faith. God just simply wants us to follow Him and to walk with Him. So we find here God warned, if we head back to Exodus chapter 7, God warned Moses of Pharaoh's rejection. So Moses would not be discouraged or be surprised when it happened. We ought to be the same way when we share our faith with others. Narrow is the road, really, that leads to salvation and eternal life. Wide is the path that most will travel upon. And God gives us the same encouragement. But notice he says here in verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, it's interesting, this phrase, it brings to the question, did God want Pharaoh to reject him? Did he actually make Pharaoh reject him? Well, what about Pharaoh's free will? Well, that's an interesting thought. Go, if you would, with me to 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now, the context of this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 6 is really with the Philistines, they take the ark of God. They bring it into their false god, Dagon. <clears throat> and uh, because of that, God will put his heavy hand upon these Philistines, cause them to have, <clears throat> I'll use the word that you find in the Bible, it sounds so much better, emeralds, you know. They're going to have this physical affliction. <clears throat> but we find nestled in here some truth. Look at 1 Samuel 6.6. 6. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts. Why are you hardening your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wonderfully among them? Did they not let the people go and they departed? And so we find here from Exodus chapter 7 verse 3 and for Samuel 6, 6, we find here these passages that God will only harden the heart of someone who has already rejected his message. You think about this. The first Pharaoh, the Pharaoh that came before the current Pharaoh, got to see the wonders and miracles and amazing things that Jehovah God did as he worked through the life of Joseph. God never gives up on those who live and breathe on this planet. Never. Just as Jesus, until he gave up the ghost, until he gave up his life as he hung unrecognized on the cross, shed, his blood shed so, so distorted from the beating that he looked like a worm as he hung on there. And as he labored to speak, he would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Jesus today still, to the very last breath, 
of every person on this planet desires to redeem them through his shed blood that they might spend eternity in heaven. Why do we write people off? We write ourselves off. Well, God can't use me. He can't use me and my family. They know what I'm really like. Well, you're right. He can't. Sorry. But God can. He can work through you because of His grace. He can do the impossible. Today, our culture that we live in today, their, hard, their hearts are hardened to the, God, to the living God, to God. Do you know somebody who's reached the point of a hardened heart? It starts with a stubborn heart, a hardened heart. You know, if you uh, look at Exodus chapter 7, look at verse 4, we see the hardness of Pharaoh, but God always in his grace and his mercy desires to work in the hearts of people. Look at Exodus 7, 4. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. You see, to put his hand upon Egypt that we find here in the scriptures would be to show God's great power and wonders. God had a reason for doing that. He wanted to, for the nation of Israel to know that who he was and that he could deliver and bring freedom from bondage. But he's also going to show Egypt and Pharaoh that there is one true God who always has and always is and always will be, who is in control of all things, who has power far beyond what your sorcerers, sorcerers can just conjure up. All the judgments that would come and the wonders, once they were over, every Egyptian and Pharaoh would know that the great I am, Jehovah God, there is only one God. There would be no question. And yet some would harden their hearts. You see, if you go, hold your place there, go over to the Gospel of John for a minute. The Gospel of John chapter 12. And go down to verse 31. I'm going to skim through these quickly. You'll find the references up on the screen. It says this, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, that is Satan, be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, Jesus speaking of himself, from the earth will draw all men unto me. That's Jesus' heart and desire. If you go to John chapter 3, <clears throat> head back just a few in chapters and look at verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This was the ultimate purpose of God in displaying who he was in his great power. He wanted the Egyptians, and catch this, he also wanted the Israelites, God's chosen people, just as he wants you and I to see that he is a great God, that through his strength and through his miracles, through his power, that as we believe in him, as we acknowledge him, that he is, he is the only true God, God can do the amazing. He wanted to do that in the life of the Israelites. He wanted to do that in the life of the Egyptians. He wants to do that in your heart and life. So we see a command, a caution here. If you go back to Exodus chapter 7, again, <clears throat> I want you to see this next thought. You see, the power of God was now going to be seen against the very power of the Egyptians for the first time. And it's interesting, if you look back in, uh, let's go back to Exodus chapter 5 for a minute, and I want you to see this, the first couple of verses. This was the first time that Moses and, and Aaron walked into the, into the presence of Pharaoh. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in, told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice, that feast sacrifice to worship God, sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. You find here <clears throat> that God had already told Moses previously to take that wood. What do you have in your hand? The rod? Throw it down, cast it down, and I'll turn it into a serpent. 
We don't find any evidence in chapter 5 here that that ever happened. But if you go to uh, Exodus chapter 7, look at verses 8 and 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Well, we've heard that one before. You see, in God's long suffering and his graciousness, he is simply just reminding them, I'm going to do something in the heart of Pharaoh and those in the court that day. Yes, they're stubborn. They've rejected, they will reject my message, my truth. They will harden their own hearts. And it will come to a point where I will just remove my hand and let them go down the path that they want to go so badly on. Sometimes the very truth that we know, that we forget about, we need to be reminded of. Because God's plan always works best. We just need to be reminded of sometimes. Look at Exodus 7, at the next part of verse 9, and it shall become a serpent. All Moses had to do, Aaron, take that rod and cast it down. What does that take? Obedience. And God would do the miracle part of it. It would turn the wood into a serpent. For these Egyptians, this serpent was just one of thousands of false gods that they would look to for power. And God would use that as the beginning of a wonder to work and remind not only Moses, but Pharaoh that he was a powerful God. Moses just had to be faithful and obey, and the miracle would happen. In 1 Thessalonians, do I have that? Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the Bible says this, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. You see, our God is faithful. He says, listen, I've chosen you to go to this land, to this world, and I will equip you. I will help you. I will be with you. I'll give you the words to say. I'll teach you. I will show you what to do. Monday's coming right around the corner. Most of us have a boss, people that we work with, people we rub elbows with, and God wants us to take the very same message of the gospel to them. But I can't. It's the workplace. If I say that, you know, I might get fired from my job. And that may be true. Well, what about my neighborhood, my neighbors? Well, they've heard it before. I've been there I don't know how many times. Someone crosses your path. Well, I'm in a hurry. You know, I got to pick up my Fruit Loops down in aisle number three. Just don't have time today. But God is at work and has the power. He'll be with you and I, and he just wants us to simply take the message and deliver it, and he'll do all the work. He'll do the impossible. He'll do, do the miraculous. Hold your place there, and let's zip over to uh, Matthew for a minute, Matthew 28. Now, I know this is a familiar verse. Matthew 28. And go down to uh, verse 18. Jesus came and said unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It's an amazing promise that God will be with you and I. He just simply wants us to yoke up with him, walk with Jesus, and be obedient to what he shows us. And the question is, is as we do that, when we catch ourselves, well, I can't, don't really have the opportunity, maybe I ought to be praying, God, give me the opportunity in the workplace, in my neighborhood, in my family. I don't know how you're going to... Well, God, when you do provide the opportunity, help me to be obedient. 
And Lord, will you just do what I cannot do through your word and by your spirit in the heart and life? Of, you think about that, how God is at work and he all power in heaven and earth, the authority of Jesus Christ given unto the body of Jesus Christ <clears throat> to tread on serpents, to bind and release, to speak truth. We don't walk with that authority most of the time because we forget about who we are in Christ and who He is. But when we do find ourselves in our infirmities, in our weaknesses, in our failures, when we've just blown it, that's when God says, okay, will you yoke up and be reminded that I'm with you? And I can work through that. If, if I just looked at all the ugly t-shirts that hung in the old closet of Ken Werner, all my failures, the times that I disobeyed, the times I walked in unbelief, the times I fail as a husband, the times I fail as a parent, the times I fail as a friend, the times I just, the closet would be full, full. But listen, the key that opens the door to that closet has been thrown away. I can't even get in there. So why is it that I go back and try to open the door? Look for the key. Try to peek under the door. There, it, well, there's, I don't see any light coming out of there. No! You'll never find in your failures in your past. The hope that we have in Christ is when you find yourself, I can't, God says, I can. I am with you, and I desire to work with you and in the lives of other people. All right, we've got to begin to wrap, wrap this up. Go back to Exodus chapter 7, and we'll go on to this last point. We see a command, we see a caution, a confirmation. It's now time for Moses and Aaron to go before Pharaoh. They, God just simply wanted to work through them. They, God chose Moses, and yes, he would choose Aaron, but there was nothing special about them, but God would work through them in a simple rod to display his miraculous power. But I want you to see their, their obedience here. Look in Exodus chapter 7 and look at verse 10. And Moses and Aaron, what are the next two words? Help me out. They went in. That means there's motion. They heard what God had commanded. He warned, he warned Moses and Aaron that you're going to be rejected. They're not rejecting you, by the way. They're rejecting my message. But listen, I want to confirm in you who holds all the power. But it comes down to this, just like in your life and my life. There has to be a point where we, by faith and God's grace, just begin to step out in obedience. They went. They went in. They actually chose to go. They could have chose not to go. Well, maybe another time. It's just not convenient right now. We're too busy. Really? Moses, look at Exodus 7.10, and Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a servant. You see, obeying God took faith. Do you think it was easy for Moses or Aaron to go in to the most powerful man, a 22-year-old on the planet? You know how 22-year-olds think? I do. I was one once. Oh, yeah, I got it all figured out. I know how this works. Yeah, mom, dad, pff, yeah, you'll eventually come around and see how the way life really works. Really? And I've got all the resources to back it up. It's not just the brilliancy of a 22-year-old and those hormones raging through his body that he's got life figured out. No, he's got the army behind him. He's got the wealth behind him. He's got the world's power behind him. So we find Moses and Aaron go in, sent by God, just as Jesus sends you and I. And the question is, will we go? In John chapter 20, verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, he appears to his disciples after his resurrection, just psh, appears to him in a room, John 20, 21. And he says this, peace be unto you, as my father hath sent me, Jesus said, even so send I you. So here's a question, who will be the Pharaoh in your life this week? Is there a neighbor, a boss, a friend, family member? who you need, you know you need to share the gospel with. 
it's not about how they will respond. It's simply our job to take the message. Now we, you know, <clears throat> we have the, I don't know if the, what the word is, luxury, blessing, to grow up and to be in a church where our preacher will remind you and I again and again why we're here on this planet and the authority we have in Christ. And the message that we have that can change the heart and life from the inside out. And you and I are evidence of that. And God still desires to do that. And the culture, I know the culture that we live in today is insane. That things are just turned upside down right now. That nothing makes sense. Wrong is right and right is wrong. And everything that should be proclaimed as being silenced. But God is still at work, just as he was in the day of Moses. And you and I, we will cross paths with people that we will consider the pharaohs. It doesn't matter how they respond. The question is, will you and I be obedient and follow God and trust him? You see, the message in miracle wasn't received the way Moses and Aaron probably believed. I'm sure that in their heart of hearts, they thought, you know what? We're coming in the power and authority of God. And when we proclaim this command, he's going to see this great wonder. And he's going to let God's people go. That wasn't the case. In fact, Satan was at work. Those wise men, those sorcerers, those magicians came in. Guess what they did? We got rods too. Threw it down. You see, we'll always find... In spiritual warfare, there's always an enemy at work behind the scenes who never wants credit, who will work at our lowest moment, our weakest time, maybe within your family, the most vulnerable. He doesn't care and doesn't want the credit. If he can get you and I to think it's her problem or his problem or that child's problem, all the better. Moses saw opposition and you and I will see it. But you see the obedience that Moses and Aaron showed, God would bless. Look at verse 12 and we begin to wrap this up. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. God did the, the amazing. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, a couple more verses and we'll be done. How about one more verse and we'll be done? Maybe two, all right. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul would say this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. To Paul, as it is to you and I, who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, look what the scriptures say. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, God is still in the life-changing business and wants to change people from the inside out. But he needs someone that, not in their own strength or their intellect or how well they speak, he's looking for someone like you and I who are just simply obedient and will walk by faith. And God will do the impossible. We may not see the fruit. Now catch this. Sometimes it goes a whole life. And after, in death, fruit is produced sometimes in the life of other people. We may not see the fruit, but God, it doesn't change the fact that God commands us to give the gospel. The question is, is what will I commit to this week? It came to a point where Moses and Aaron just simply had to step out by faith and do what God had commanded them to do. That would take faith. It would take trust, even knowing that God told them, Pharaoh's not going to respond. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to harden his heart. He's been stubborn. The Pharaoh before him, he, they got to see the wonders how I created all this wealth and sustained them through a drought. They rejected me. And as we walk through this culture, what will we do? Listen, God would be with Moses and Aaron and prove himself to be faithful. But if the story had just ended there, Moses obeying, nothing would have ever been accomplished until Moses and Aaron just simply obeyed and stepped out by faith. 
God had given the promises. The rest, now think about this, depended upon Moses and Aaron. Yes, God can do, he can find somebody else and raise them up. But you think about that. The people that God allows to cross your path, you can affect their eternity by what you say or by what you don't say. It's amazing to think, <clears throat> I've got to work at a job now for almost 28 years. I find it amazing that sometimes you'll cross paths with people. They'll make a comment to you about a word that you've long forgotten and a face you barely recognize that you spoke that made an impact in their life in a career that would forever change the course of their life. Now, I'm not talking about a job. I mean, although that's an amazing thing to think, but a word spoken. We're talking about the eternity of where someone will spend, and God says, I want to use you in their life. The people that cross your paths every day, the people that call you out of the blue, the people that you rub, run into at the post office, the grocery store. God wants to use you and I in the lives of those people. God had given his promises, but it came down to a point where Moses and Aaron would have to obey and walk by faith. And God commands you and I to go. The question is, will we trust him? The, you know, if you go, let's, this is the last verse. Go over to Matthew chapter 11. I don't know why this one popped in, but we'll just follow it. Matthew chapter 11. I love this, Jesus, as he says, just follow me. Look at verse 28. Come unto me. Jesus says to you and I by application today, no matter where you're at in life, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. There's a choice in that, by the way, to yoke up with him by faith. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I love that about our Jesus. When we think we can't, sometimes we have to wait, trust in the Lord. Think about that. A thousand years. It's like one day. And if the microwave door won't shut and it doesn't work, I'm like, how am I going to even function at lunch without heating up some leftovers? And yet we, in our impatience, have a God that's long-suffering and wants to work through us in the lives of other people. The question is, what will we do? What will we do this week? Are you yoked up with Jesus? Is he teaching you and I? He can bring rest. The question is, do we come unto him? Most of the time, that's where we struggle. I'm heavy laden and burdened. We forget about who we're yoked up with and how God has chosen you and I to work in the lives of other people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word, the challenge from your word and the reminder of who you are. You're such a long-suffering and faithful God. Gracious, merciful, who stepped into our hearts and lives and again and again and again and again desired that we'd see our need for Jesus as Savior and believe on Him. And Father, that, that day that, that we believed on Christ and you began a relationship, you have been faithful in spite of our responses, our unbelief, in our infirmities. And yet again and again, you just simply want us to acknowledge who you are and that you are everything. When we fail, you can pick us up. When we respond badly, you can remind us of who we are in Christ. When we find ourselves in situations that seem unchangeable and that there's no hope, you're a God of hope that can bring deliverance. It may not always work out the way we desire, but you always do the right thing. 
Lord, give us wisdom today. Help us to respond to your truth in a very specific way as individuals as we continue to worship you in the next hour. Father, I pray that as our preacher comes, that you'd give him just liberty to proclaim your truth. You'd loose it again. You'd work in our hearts. Lord, if there is one here in this, this, this hour or in the hour to come that, that has never put their faith on Jesus Christ, Lord, help them to see their need for Jesus. Help them to set aside the excuses and the religion and the things that they think they have to do and see Jesus, the one that's done it all, who said it is finished. Father, thank you for what you'll do. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We are dismissed.